Yeah, I do know I got some emails. This is the last uh, week of summer vacation for a lot of people, or at least last two weeks. And so um, I know a lot of people are gone today because they're doing vacation time before school starts here. So, all right, I'm going to um, do a little reminder of why we're here. Um, the vision of this whole idea of love our cities is to love our cities so that our cities will thrive. And, and our, our mission is to help our cities lead the Citywide Volunteer Days, which is that catalytic event um, that spurs on everything else we do, including, secondly, the facilitating citywide initiatives, having a year-round impact, um, not just a once a day, but year-round impact. And then certainly um, we become citywide conveners. You know, when we're, when we're building our reputation and, and getting that notoriety in our cities, uh, the city starts looking to us to start convening um, all the good that is going on in our cities. And so all that while we're networking and collaborating here as well. So that's our, our vision, that's our mission. I, this fall, they're just, uh, here's the cities that are having their citywide volunteer days. Um, September 3rd is Anaheim, September 16th, Los Alamitos, uh, September 24th, uh, Irvine and La Habra, uh, October 1st, Madera, Colorado Springs, Orange, Stockton, Ventura, and then Florence and Slocomi Valley are doing all month kind of focuses. Um, October 8th, New Braunfels, Riverside and Salida, and then October 15th, Newport Beach and La Mirada. If I missed you, um, let me know. <laughs> Uh, I want to make sure we've got everyone included here. And if you know any other cities that are doing things um, that maybe I don't know about, um, please let me know. I want to include that in our list here. Um, if your city has, and I think most of you do, you send mass emails out to your, you know, to your city, to your volunteers and all that, please make sure my email is on that. I want to get everyone's cities, um, you know, the, the email updates they send out. There's so many different creative ideas that I can gather and send out to the other cities. Um, we're just talking on the phone a little bit here where Chris is at about what they're doing in Florence and um, about you know the idea of washing police cars as a project idea and other public service vehicles. I mean, those are some of the ideas that, that can work anywhere. And so I just wanna make sure we get that out. Um, those ideas I wanna get out. So please make sure I'm on your emails uh, that you send out. Um, in case you missed it, I want to share with you, I'm going to try to share with you, here is what our book cover is going to look like. And many of you contributed to making this thing just how we feel the best it can be. Um, love our cities, how our citywide volunteer day can unite and transform your community. Um, so super excited about this book. It should be coming out. Um, author copies mid-October, and, and then I want to figure out how to get all you guys a copy. Um, so we have to figure that out, getting addresses and things like that. Um, um, the, uh, the public release is next April, so it's going to be a while, um, but I guess it takes that long for all the marketing and pre-sales and all that kind of stuff, um, but super excited about getting this out and using this as a tool to, uh, to share this vision and trying to get more cities on board. Um, we're already starting our follow-up book. <laughs> Um, it looks like it's going to be like a 40 day devotional and a number of publishers are really interested in this idea of kind of going off of these themes that are in this book and making a devotional. Um, so really excited about that thing. Uh, hopefully in the next year that should be out as well. Um, I've been asked um, by some of you in the past, like, hey, how does Love Our Cities work? The organization, how are y'all funded? <laughs> like, how does this thing, how does this thing work? So I'll share with you, we have five major funding streams. Number one is this newest one is hopefully this book is going to sell some copies. Um, and so everything um, that any, all the profits that this uh, book um, and future books will make goes to our organization. It doesn't go to me. It doesn't, it's not an author. Um, I don't accumulate anything from that. It's, it is all goes to the organization, which does pay me and pay others that work here. Um, but that hopefully will be a, a decent funding stream. We'll see. Um, individual donors. Um, we have a few individual donors that support, um, this work and we need more. <laughs> um, you know, we're still a year, we're a year and a half old officially as an organization. So we're still young, um, but certainly individual donors and family donors. Your city annual donation at the end of October every year 
between depending on your size of your city, 750 to 2,500. That is a funding stream. Um, our, we have a golf tournament coming up annually at the end of August every year. So it's coming up real soon. And that is a, a, a good funding stream um, to create the funds that we need. And if any of you guys are doing golf tournaments, I've become somewhat of an expert <laughs> in the last seven years. I, I kind of like it in a weird way. I don't know why, um, but I would love to help any golf tournaments you guys do. I'd love to um, even collaborate and share ideas. And then the other thing, the final thing um, I can think of is our auction. We have an online auction. And I want to share with you this because I think this be some ideas for you to consider that has been a wonderful thing for us um, that you might want to consider for your city here. So here's some of the auction, you know, it's just a, actually if you go, I will just keep it right here. Um, there's a homepage, we'll forget that. But these are just some, you know, auction items that are all online. Um, some of these are somewhat regional in this area. Uh, probably most are, um, but some of these can be from anywhere. So we have, you know, Yosemite home, you know, these uh, trips that I got from Jay Williams on a Fullerton, I got this idea from him. He got a contact where these trips were amazing last year. They generated a lot of funds, um, these Antigua and um, Barbados and things like that. You know, local sports teams are always wins, you know, wine tours. Um, I'll let you look at that. If you go to loveourcities.org backslash auction that, and I'll put this in the follow-up email, but you can kind of dive through this more and just get ideas and maybe this might work for you. Maybe it won't. Um, but it has definitely been a good funding stream, you know, for, for us. So, um, anyhow, that is one of our ways that we raise funds. And I'm going to share with you too, some of those trips, anyone can purchase those from anywhere, right? I mean, it doesn't matter if you're in Florence, South Carolina or Texas or whatever you, you know, you got to purchase your own flight to Antigua or whatever, but, um, I want to, I want to ask you all to help support, send this out maybe to you guys, to, you know, to who, you know, as well. Um, if you could help in that way that, that, you know, last year we had a people who won some of these prizes from all over the country. It wasn't just from this area, depending on the item there. And I think those trips are kind of the main, the main thing. Um, uh, yeah. Any questions about funding and fundraising and ideas, uh, auction or whatever, I'll stay on the call afterwards and uh, we can, we can talk about that. Whoever's interested. Um, Ian Stevenson, share a little bit about your conference coming up in October. Sure. Yeah. So we've been doing this uh, kind of a conference, like Jeff said, it's called City on a Hill Leaders Roundtables. And uh, it's basically designed uh, for leaders like yourselves to bring a team of pastors um, primarily and leaders from your city. They they'd probably want to be Christ following leaders at this particular scenario um and what we do is we bring in different speakers and communicators that help them think about how to take the movement in their city to the next level um so the the focus on this one is going to be a lot around prayer how prayer is such a driving force uh in these movements in our cities and then we will have breakouts. So in the breakouts, so like Jeff is coming down and he's going to do a breakout on doing um, these, you know, citywide volunteer days in your city and how that helps really catalyze and create movement. We're having uh, Tracy Beal from School Connect come out. She'll be talking about how working together around your schools helps catalyze and make a difference in your city. Um, so if you know anything about Tracy Beal and School Connect, they're, they're the leaders in creating community engagement around schools in the country and um, do a great job. So we're going to be, um, there's a, a main speaker, then there will be these breakouts, and then at each table, the leaders will work together to determine what are our next steps for this next year, what's our next steps. And um, Curtis has been um, to them, I think, every time we've done one, huh, Curtis? Um, and so they, they, it just kind of keeps evolving. And we have found that they've been very helpful to City Catalyst as you're trying to develop your, your team and you're trying to develop and create movement in your city. So it's on October 27th 
Um, it's going to be in Costa Mesa, California this year, and it goes from 830 in the morning till two o'clock uh, in the afternoon. And um, if it would serve any of you, we, we'd love to have you come and bring a team. Thank you, Ian. If you, in the chat, if you can put maybe the website and your contact information, and then people can contact you. And I'm also going to follow up in an email as, as well. Sure. Excited to be part in this fall. This is going to be fun. All right, Dave Runyon, what's up? How's it going? Hey, man? how's it going, everybody? You're doing good. Dave, when you when did we meet? How did we meet? Bad discernment. Um, <laughs> good call. <laughs> I don't. I'm, I'm either, you're, you're. I don't know. One of <laughs> somebody's bad discernment. Uh, yeah. It had to be twelve years ago. Yeah, it's been a long time. Well, I am so excited to have you a part of this call and um, and just to share, you know, whatever you want to share, man, I'm going to trust you. <laughs> I hope hope it's uh, hope you're going to stay. Yeah, and I, yeah, I know you will. But if we're going to talk about neighboring or whatever you want to talk about, man, I just want you to encourage these different cities that are here that certainly will be listening after the fact that couldn't be here today. Um, but share a little bit about yourself, a little bio and um, and just what you're passionate about. Sure. I'll give a plug for Ian, too. Um, I think some of the things that they're doing are legit. So if you, if you've never gotten eyes on Ian's stuff, it's worth going to that conference and kind of checking it out. Um, I think their, their movement is one of the more thoughtful, intentional strategic movements around. So, um, yeah. So my name is Dave. I like, uh, I would imagine a number of you on this call spent some time in, vocational church staff ministry and so I, I actually I, so I've been here in Colorado uh, my almost my entire life uh, spent a few years as a high school teacher and a golf coach I got sucked into uh, vocational ministry kind of through the back door um, I didn't go the traditional seminary route I ended up uh, I was at a church uh, here in the Denver metro area that was kind of one of those, you know, attractional laser show young adult churches that I was going to. And then I ended up uh, starting to, to just volunteer and uh, teach and preach and kind of blinked and found myself doing the, the church thing for 10 years. And there was a lot about it that I loved. And uh, there was also a lot about it that I really wrestled with, specifically like the amount of time and energy as a pastor that I was spending on this hour and 10 minutes every um, week seemed disproportionate to what was in my heart and what I wanted to do. And a lot of that was my own junk. I mean, I love, love the local church. Um, I'm still deeply involved in, in a local church here in the Denver metro area, but I just made a, a decision after wrestling through a lot of how we do that, um, that maybe I wanted to, to focus my time and my energy on helping mobilize people instead of helping like inspire them from the front doing 30 minute talks. And so uh, that was a huge shift for me. And it, it took me towards a lot of the stuff that you, a lot of you on this call have read. So um, I started reading a lot around the missional church and externally focused stuff. Uh, Eric Swanson's work, uh, his two books, the externally focused church and to transform a city had a massive impact on me personally. And I just got the bug for, uh, for really John 17 and for Jesus's prayer for unity. There's a lot, there's a lot I could say about that journey. Uh, but a big part of it was that as I started to kind of shift my, the church that I was on staff at towards uh, being more externally focused. Um, I just, I remember just doing like, we did a big oil change thing for single moms. This is, this had to be like 2000 and 2007, somewhere around there. So we were starting to kind of like feel our way into the community, get to know the community a little bit better. <laughs> we did this oil change and it was, it was cool. There's probably 18 single moms that came through that day. And, and I think they were served really well. Um, but I just had this sign, like, this isn't going to change our city. Um, and that's when I started to really think about uh, having a lot of meals, a lot of cups of coffee with other leaders in my community and to just start to ask those questions. Like, you know, what would it look like if we came together 
uh, to make the gospel tangible in our city? And could we actually start to, to move and to shift uh, systemic issues in our city by working together? So all that stuff got to me. And I feel like I'm probably preaching to the choir. I feel like there's a lot of everybody, everybody on this call in some way is probably drinking the, the John 17 Kool-Aid. And so all that stuff happened to me. And I got to a place where uh, there were some people around me, uh, a couple of business owners that I had been walking with as a pastor, praying with them, helping them dream about how they want to leverage their company. Um, two of these business owners said, David, if what you want to do is to go out to the city, we'll free you up to do that. And I've just been in such a unique place since then. I, I kept a role at both of those companies, helping them kind of as a director of community involvement. Um, but for the last 12 years, uh, those two business owners have made it so that I don't have to worry about money, which is, if you do this city stuff, <laughs> that's really nice. Uh, so, um, I mean, I love, I love Jeff's merging expertise on golf course and golf tournaments, uh, but I'm so thankful that I don't have to do it. Uh, <laughs> so, um, and having, having that patron model has its disadvantages. Um, and, it, and there's also some huge ad, advantages as well. Um, and I'm happy to stay on a little bit and, and talk about that afterwards, Jeff. Um, but that, that for me was just the ultimate game changer. It just created margin in my schedule where I could begin to follow the breadcrumbs and to be really intentional about um, meeting with faith and government and business leaders uh, in order to dream about like, where's that sweet spot overlap that we could, uh, that we could really mobilize the body of Christ in our, in our city together. And so having that margin was, was just a massive, massive game changer. We did the community conversation model that I think most of Ray Bakke, I think was the first that I um, can tell it was really doing that. Like, Hey, we're going to put a bunch of uh, faith leaders in the room invite in local government leaders in order to learn about the local government leaders and connect with them and also to, to ask them to, to give us the vision for how we can work together. And so we did, we've done, that's still something what we do to this day uh, here uh, with in my part of the Denver metro area is we call them community conversations. And that, that practice, uh, and it's just so simple, right? Uh, I've never had a local government leader say no. I think they all, and, and all the way up, whether it's, the mayor of Denver or down to the, you know, uh, assistant city manager in Arvada. Every single time I've been blown away. Now they might not be able to do it at the same time, but they've never seen, like, they never just say, no, I can't meet there. I think they, part of that is just self-serving. They realize when you're meeting with faith leaders, you're meeting with somebody who every single week is talking to, you know, thousands of people are represented in that room. Uh, and so, uh, so th those community conversations have been, critical for us to really learn our city and to get to know our city and then we've done all the other stuff where we've taken the bus tours around and uh, had our police chief you know take us into the parts of the city that maybe were invisible to some of us and so all of that stuff and I, I know that you guys this is probably pretty trite but like if you're gonna if you're gonna love your city you have to know your city and so exegeting our community has been a huge huge piece of the puzzle for us and it's helped it's just given it's created space where leaders can just rub shoulders against each other, you know, where um, civic and business owners and faith leaders are in the same spaces together, learning together. And that's been, that's been a really important thing that's happened in our city. Um, so we've done schools. We, we, that was the first thing we did. We had a police chief that said, hey, if you really care about your, our city in the long term, you should go after the Title I schools and the families and the teachers and the facilities. Um, so that's been a big push for us. Um, we, we spent a lot of time on that. And what you, what you said about Tracy Beal, uh, they are for sure, they're the best that I know of in the country uh, when it comes to kind of thinking about church and school partnerships. Uh, and then after, and, and we, by the way, we only do one thing. I just don't have the bandwidth. I'm not trying to build like a big team or an organization. So we pick one thing and we do it for multiple years at a time. Um, so when we did schools, that was a three-year run. And when we started to get traction for schools, um, everybody and their mother came towards us, towards me and said, hey, you're getting pastors together. Can I just have 10 minutes to do this? Or, you know, so all these ideas came. That was one of the hardest things was just to say, 
no, this was identified by a civic leader. We're going to try to go after this and do it really well. And we're not going to do anything else. And, and so that, that was a tough, tough decision because people are always feeling like you could really, we could change the world together. If you would just let me um, use that little group to do it. <laughs> so, uh, and so if you do this work, I'm sure you've had some of these experiences, but that for us, um, it was mainly a capacity decision just to do one thing. Uh, so we did schools uh, for the first two or three years, 2010, 2011. We had this meeting with our mayor that just changed the trajectory of my life personally and you know, on so many different levels. Uh, but for me and my family, um, it, it was so powerful when we asked our mayor to say, you know, if you could wave a magic wand, what would you change in our city? And our mayor um, had this long list of things, but at the very end, just almost as a throwaway thought, he said, you know, if you really wanted, if you really wanted to do something that would impact our city the most, you should start a neighboring movement. And he just went on to just talk uh, uh, really briefly about the power of proximity, about what happens, uh, like how when when the people are close with their immediate neighbors, it takes weight off of all the systems that government leaders are trying to create for people in need, and. And so that for me was a, a humbling moment in a lot of ways, a very convicting moment, uh, because at that time in my life, I was running around serving on different nonprofit boards doing all these different things. And I wasn't being very intentional in my own neighborhood uh, just because I was busy. I just had other stuff going on. And so uh, that group of faith leaders that was in the room and that heard that and there was a couple of business owners in the room uh, that just started us all down this journey of walking this out in our own lives first and then challenging the, the people that, that they were leading in their churches. At that time, I, I had moved on to, to just run City Unite. I wasn't a, a lead pastor, but so all these other pastors used their platform to say, you know, what if when Jesus said to love your neighbor, what if he meant your actual neighbors too? Um, and that was a dance because we, we don't uh, clearly in Jesus's economy, um, our, the, the idea of loving your neighbor goes beyond just the people who are sleeping 40, 50, 60 feet away from you. Um, and so we didn't want to dismiss any of that. We wanted to actually, you know, honor and validate all the great work that people were doing, loving their neighbor, whether it be down to the rescue mission or overseas or at their places of work or with the parents on their kid's soccer team. Um, so to, to do that in a way where we lifted that up, but also said, hey, that doesn't, that doesn't just sprinkle magic fairy dust over your actual neighbors and all of a sudden Jesus wasn't talking about them um, and so it was just a it was a really simple movement of kind of going back to the basics um, we, we just chat we just asked people uh, really simply to learn and retain and use their neighbors names uh, and that because for us as pastors when we started to do that it started to shift things so it sounds really simple right we're not we're not challenging people to love their actual neighbors that's like crazy Jesus stuff. Uh, we, we just said, would, would you just be willing to learn and retain and use their names? Um, and what we learned is that it's a Trojan horse. Um, if if people love Jesus and if they just start to learn and retain and use their neighbor's names, if they have a vision for like, holy cow, what I do in my front yard counts. It's real ministry. If, if they have that in their heart and they love God, that, and I don't, that's a big assumption that the people that we're leading actually like are, that we're discipling them. <laughs> but, but if we are, um, and if they start to learn and retain and use their neighbor's names, it's this Trojan horse that just puts people on a trajectory to do all kinds of other stuff. Um, some of those neighbors, not all of them, but some of those neighbors, you just start to follow the breadcrumbs and organic, genuine, real relationships start to develop. Uh, and if our people love God, and I, and I believe we talk about the things that we love, we share the things we love, and they start to be in relationship with the people right around them. What we, what we saw is uh, just an incredible soil for spiritual uh, curiosity and spiritual conversations and um, for people to come to know Jesus in general. And so, um, so that, that was, I mean, it's hard to believe. So my, my buddy and I wrote a book that came out in 2012. By the way, Jeff, if your funding model is any way related to selling books, you're in big trouble. 
Um, <laughs> so my, my buddy and I wrote a book. Uh, that was in 2012. And I spent the last two years, the, the movement for us, per, for me personally, started um, a year and a half before that, but uh, the conversation with the mayor. But um, I spent the last 10 years just learning more and more about uh, the, the power of just place-based relationships and just going around to different cities and uh, staying in my own city and just really kind of talking about what does it mean to have a theology of place and what are the ramifications of that? What, what happens when believers decide to do that together in a specific geographic location? Uh, it's been a lot of fun. Um, and then the last five years, I've really found myself, the stuff that I saw with those two business owners is one of the most fruitful things I've ever seen uh, in my life and in, in the, all my time in and around the church and um, in ministry. I, I watched a couple of business owners get this, like go from like volunteering in our children's ministry, which is really good. I, they took, they, you know, one of these guys came and took a spiritual gifts test. And then we like put him in children's ministry, probably just because we didn't have anybody in children's ministry. And, he just sat there for three years and his entire vision for like how he could use his gifts uh, was pretty much limited to, to I'm going to go to church and then I'm, I'm going to stay an extra hour and serve in children's ministry. Uh, meanwhile, this he has 80 employees that he's around for 50 hours a week. Um, and to watch him go from that to knowing his heart, like I am going, God, how do you want to use my work and my company? to further the kingdom. And then, you know, so walking with these two business owners and seeing the fruit of, um, of what happens when, when employers, business leaders, when people have that, when they also make that shift around work has, um, has haunted me. And I've spent the last few years building some cohorts in the Denver metro area of business owners of men and women uh, who are believers and putting them around each other and helping them really think strategically about building their culture of their company and then working together for city impact through that. And that's been, that's been a lot of fun. Um, there's something really, really potent about working with business owners because they just are wired to execute and to get things done. So, yeah. so anyway, that's a little bit of my story. I can go into more of the neighboring stuff, Jeff, but why don't I pause there and yeah. just create some space for some questions. And then Jeff, if there's anything specific that you want me to dive into, um, please prompt me. Okay. All right. Any uh, any questions? Any thoughts? Anybody want to share? Hey, I got a question for you. Yeah. So you you mentioned earlier that you um, you know focused on one thing and just kind of did that one thing for several years. Has that philosophy changed at all like are you are you still doing anything with schools and, and then you're also doing neighboring so i'm curious how that thought process maybe has evolved for you yeah great question ian so when when we started the school um church partnership uh, stuff we leaned in that for three years and then when when my little group i mean i most of the people that are leading around me already have full time, you know, a lot of them are in ministry or leading nonprofits in the city that are really at the heart of connecting leaders and being hubs in different geographic areas around the metro area. So, uh, so our, my staff is myself and an admin assistant for actually for just City Unite. And so we're, we're running really lean. So after three years of building some of those church school partnerships, when we started to pull back off of that focus and lean towards neighboring, they all kept going. So the, the church, not, they didn't all keep going. The churches that were dialed in and that had built significant relationships, um, that that work just continued on. And mm -hmm. there's cohorts of churches here in the city that still get together um, specifically around the school partnerships. So then we did the, we did neighboring from 2011 to 2014. And by the way, one of the big pieces of that, Ian, was the pastors decided we're going to take three weeks a year and we're going to put our own agendas aside and we're going to go after something from the front together. And so that started with the neighboring stuff. We actually did the neighboring stuff two years in a row of just saying, we're going to take three weeks each. We're all going to go after this and talk about it. 
um, and really try to hopefully make, you know, bake it into the DNA of what the church was doing instead of just another sermon series. Um, so we did, we did a number of years on the neighboring front. Um, and I would say out of the, if I was going to be honest, out of the 22 original congregations that were involved in that, I think there's like six or seven of them that it is just deeply woven into everything they do um and they continue i mean you just walk into those churches and and there's this sense of like hey if you're gonna be part of our church we want you to be you know we want you to be growing as a neighbor on your own block mm -hmm. and they just repeat that over and over and over again um and then now the work stuff has really started to kind of shift so i'm i still do a lot of neighboring stuff but not out not inside of my own city um the churches that are doing that have continued on with it most of the stuff I'm doing neighboring now, Ian, is traveling to other cities, helping them gather leaders and and just start the movement. Yeah. So uh, you the, see the way you guys are approaching it kind of is like a stimulant. You know, yes. you do it for three years, you stimulate it, and then they keep the traction going. That's the approach you're taking. Uh, Lynn exactly. asked a great question here in the chat about, do you have any written stuff put together around how you're doing the business cohort stuff? Do you have any like material that could be maybe helpful to the the group here on on how you're running these business business cohorts yeah thanks i didn't even see the chat um thank you for that so um if you go to cityunite.org there's a page called work and it's got very concrete it's got some specific concrete resources that we're using with individual companies are just saying like here's here's a menu of best practices that we're seeing work with different companies and the, there's a, a number of different uh, video stories about business owners here in the Denver metro area that are doing this work so that's probably Lynn the, the best stuff I don't have anything written on how to build the cohort itself um, they've been kind of like under the radar we don't charge the the company there's lots of there's lots of great you know organizations that go after business owners and um in charge but a, a lot of time, but they're not necessarily focused on city impact. The stuff that we're doing with business owners is really focused on uh, city impact and and impacting their their own employees. So, so yeah, there's some resources there. Thanks for pointing that out. Mm -hmm. There was also almost everything we did with the neighboring stuff uh, is free, and all the small groups. And, I mean, there's there's a just ridiculous amount of content that we have on that on artofneighboring.com. Um, and there's everything you could ever want to just kind of start getting a, a movement going. If you click on that resources page, Jeff, that's probably the, um, the best way to show them what all that is. Looks like either our, it looks like my website is janky or your oh, internet's really slow. Yeah. So on that, there's like sermons the good news for pastors if you're any pastors on this call if you just want three weeks of not prepping anything without feeling like you're plagiarizing anything you should like that sermon series that we built was built by like a group of pastors and it's meant just to be used all together so we we just preach the same sermons all over the city uh so uh it's at use it verbatim tweak it do whatever you want with it COVID 19 toolkit i don't ian you guys still COVID out there you guys still do COVID stuff out there in California but I'm that might that might be getting a little dated especially for any of our friends in Florida and Texas um <laughs> uh, not yet in Washington though not yet not yeah that's right well okay I'll keep it up. I'll keep it up there for six or seven yeah. more months hopefully um there's all kinds of stuff there uh that you can the the cheat sheet for church leaders down there we wrote that a couple of years ago after working for a number of years with churches. Like, here's what we wish we would have done differently in the book. Here's what we've learned from working with uh, churches across the city, um, all of that. So, so anyway, those are, there's resources there. Um, use them, edit them, do whatever makes sense on your end. Uh, any Chris, other questions? And then, or Jeff, do you have any? Okay, go ahead. Well, Chris, you just... Chris just asked the site. So the yeah, art of neighboring.com, art of neighboring.com. I'll put that in the follow-up email as well. Sounds good. 
Yeah, I mean, yeah, I was thinking about neighboring stuff. Like, yeah, maybe that's it. That resource page is the next place to go. I mean, the thing that I remember grabbed me years ago, as you remember, was those those magnets, those those block maps. I mean, the yeah. visual, and that's even the you know your the book. See if I can get that, that on the. the I'm, I'm see if I can get that on the screen. A yeah. Bit. yeah. So this this is a little refrigerator magnet. This is a hundred times better than the book. Um, this was the key to everything that happened in our city because it, it was so I, I think one of the things we I learned about city movement and I'm, this goes exactly into you know citywide volunteer days is like the simpler you can make it yeah. the more people will actually opt in and so for uh, you know so like for us like I still can't believe that I like we wrote a book that says hey Christians like if you're serious about your faith you should know your immediate neighbor's names like that's like the basis of like an entire book and i've been like traveling around the country telling people that for for 10 years but part of the beauty of it is the simplicity of it um and this tool this tool of like here's something you can put on your fridge write down the neighbor's names that you know and, and by the way when you do this with people everyone has the same reaction they realize i've met all these people so whether you're an apartment a, a townhome a suburban a, you know rural everyone has neighbors right and so you do this little quiz or test with your people and you just go so you know how many of your neighbors names can you write down and they all start going oh my goodness i know that guy he what's his name again he has a blue truck he has two kids you know and i had the same experience when i first did it and taking people from that, from like, what's that person's name? Encouraging them to have like a face-to-face -face interaction to say, hey, this is embarrassing. I've met you three times. Um, I forgot your name. To that, that little simple act right there, um, what you get out of that is disproportionate to almost anything else you could do when it comes to like mobilizing people in faith. And so um, this tool helped people do that. It was just like, hey, I'm gonna make a commitment to learn and, and write down my immediate neighbor's names. And then this was like a refrigerator magnet and it just like, I'm not, I'm on a fake background. So it's, um, but it looks, it's just like a little tic-tac-toe board. Um, it doesn't say like, we learned, we, you know, we had to tweak this a number of times. It doesn't say artofneighboring.com. It doesn't say, it just says, who is my neighbor? Um, because what we realize is, if if you put this up on a fridge there's going to be a time when and if you're doing this well that one of your neighbors looks and goes why is my name on your fridge uh and when when it's associated with like oh i'm doing this like you know blah 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 whatever it is you know people kind of like cringe but when you can just go oh like i think it's like really important to like learn my neighbor's names this is a tool that helps me do that do you want one and to be able to like start handing these out in your own neighborhood whether people are believers or not they still have this innate desire to rediscover the art of neighboring. Um, and so, so this little tool, uh, and that, that was my biggest learning lesson in this whole thing is my whole life. People said, Dave, if you want, if you want to do something great, if you want to be a great leader, you got to set the bar high. And that's probably true with small teams and different things like that. What I accidentally learned in this whole process is that, if you want to start a movement, if you want to start something that can get a lot of traction and can spread, the key isn't to set the bar high. The key is to set the bar so low that people can't crawl underneath it. And so for us, you know, it was just, would you be willing to learn people's names? That was the lowest bar that we could think of. And, and because the bar was set so low, the number of people that said yes to doing it was really really high um, and so so it's been that's been a good learning lesson for me uh for me personally and y'all like that those magnets or we we even made them into like eight and a half by 11 sheets of paper even smaller our city jumped on board it's, it's a it's a common good thing like good neighboring and so much of what we do is yeah we work with churches but we work with the whole community this is a tool that the whole community gets and the whole community here just bought into and um, even our, remember our police cars put on the side, all of our police cars have city of great neighbors on all of our police cars. I mean, the neighboring vision, when Dave came here a couple of times, and as we just have carried this on here is, and I think having that tool, that, that, that block map tool 
has been the biggest win of continuing to inspire people to to get to know their neighbors. Neighbors, if you want to love your city, you got to love your neighborhood. Neighborhoods are like little cities. So goes the little city. So goes the big city. If the little city is thriving, and these little neighborhoods, you know, and we're all responsible for that. That I mean, we, where do I get started? Just start with your neighborhood. That's where you get started. And yeah. so it's man, it's it's an incredible vision. And, um, and there's obviously real fruit and real data that backs this up here. So I just would love to see all of our cities, not just, again, do a, a, a volunteer day, but man, the next step is, is really in your neighborhood. And, um, so, and speaking, it's interesting. That. Last night was national night out, by the way, uh, all, all around the country. So the timeliness is it's pretty awesome, you know, to do this as well. Dave, last sure. word. Um, as a city leader, a lot of city connectors on this, I just think, so like there's two lanes that I run in. If I'm talking to city leaders or if I'm, ta if I'm helping them create something that's going to go out to the masses, like not just their church community, then I'm talking to them about the, the way that neighboring impacts crime rates. I'm talking to them about um, the way that neighboring impacts, like how long people live, how many calls they're going to get to code enforcement. I mean, there's, there's so much great data up there about like, why neighboring really matters um and in my mind i'm not even though i'm not talking jesus and my faith when i'm helping them craft stuff like that's going to go their work it's still jesus principles like it, it's kingdom principles that I'm, that we're spreading out into our city um and so that's one lane that we kind of have found ourselves in and then of course the other lane is just looking at pastors and congregations and just saying hey like what if when jesus was asked to boil the entire law down to one thing what if, what if inside of his answer, what if what he gave us is a really simple strategic way that if believers actually did it, it would change our neighborhoods and our cities and our country and our world overnight. Um, and that's, that's truly, I, I believe that deep down. I believe that. And so much of my life, Jeff, I was so caught up in doing other things, programs and trying to keep things afloat that like I, I figured out a, a loophole around taking the great commandment literally. Um, I just kind of thought to myself, you know, I'm doing a lot of good stuff. I'm kind of just loving my neighbor all the time. And I just made it nice and vague and not concrete. And I would just say this to anybody on the call. Um, you know, I, and I, I'll say this too, Jeff, I was getting burned out. Like I, I, I need to be around people who think differently than I do to like feel alive. And I was in so many circles where it was just me and my Christian friends sitting in rooms strategizing, you know, how we were going to like spread the gospel. And like, and meanwhile, but, and meanwhile, we didn't have genuine connection points to a lot of people and we weren't doing life with a lot of people who didn't think like we, we were. And so this was such a gift. This is like the, this is the antidote to the Christian bubble. When you do proximity based relationships, you're guaranteeing yourself that you're going to be spending time with people who don't think about the world the same way that you do. And that for me has been a gift personally. And then I've just seen the gift as other people have lived that out um, over time. Thank you, Dave, so much for being a part. And uh, man, I appreciate you all as well being a part of this last 45 minutes. Hey, we're going to stay, Dave, if you're able to stay on the call a little bit. And if not, sure. I totally understand, but at least I'm going to be on the call for a little bit. And if you guys jump off, feel free to jump off. But if you want to ask any more questions, um, we can dialogue a little bit more about fundraising, about the... <laughs> Yeah, a book's not going to bring a lot of money. You're right. <laughs> <laughs> I don't, I'm so I don't mean to be. A I'm just trying. Hey, we're trying out the best we can. You know, I don't have two angel donors that just give everything either. So, but uh, but hey, there's value. I, I love to continue this conversation. There's so much value in having diversity. I mean, yeah, there's value in both. I guess about fundraising. Hey, you guys can jump off, but we're gonna we're gonna stay on and keep talking. Have a great day, y'all. Yeah, this book, the, the platform, uh, the message around the power of like citywide volunteer days is so cool. I don't know if any, like you guys have the best resource of like thinking about if you're going to do this in your city, we need roadmaps. We, you know, you guys can yeah. just accelerate the learning curve because of what you've learned for all these other cities that are that are starting to and want to do citywide uh, volunteer work. And so the book is well, going to be a huge it. resource. It's going to be a huge resource for people. I agree. It'd it's be not a great gonna, like, to wave around. Yeah. And I get it. And I, and I get that. And I feel like, you know, your book was the model in so many ways. Like I've shared with you, 
how it's so easy readable it's narrative there's graphics pictures whatever there's it's just i needed that's what that's what brought me in that, that's the kind of book i want to read that and, and something that was thought provoking something different than what i've read before you know i, I don't know, that inspired me incredibly and so yeah, and like you said, it's the simplest thing. We're just we're just trying to come up with something super simple to do, yeah. you know. And uh, I think that that definitely inspires in that way here. Hey guys, oh, oh, any questions? Any follow up? You guys want to those that are still on the call here? Dave, I wanted to ask you. You know, in all your experience, and you've been doing this stuff for a long time now. How how would you articulate how prayer? has been a part of the movements and the impact that you've seen. I'd love to hear your take on yeah. the, the prayer component in the context of the city. Yeah. So this is going to sound awful and then I'll try to redeem it. Um, but I want to be really honest. So when I first started gathering, trying to gather pastors um, early on 2006 ish, um, there had been some bad uh, city unity kind of like efforts that had gone before us and they, they just turned it into really long meetings that it, with commercials from every nonprofit you could think of and yeah. then long like prayer times that were just like times of like from what's been described to me is like the pastor is like bragging passive aggressively through prayer about what was going on <laughs> I'm not I'm just gonna be telling totally that so so because I heard that when I first gathered the core, you know, the kind of some of the movers and jiggers in our city, I first put six faith leaders in a room. And I am, I'm embarrassed to say this. I told them, hey, I, there's going to be no commercials and, and this isn't a prayer thing. Uh, and because I was trying to get around their defenses of like, I've been to these before. They're not good. Um, and so people still make, people still bring this up and make fun of me like, Hey Dave, remember when you pitched this and just said, Hey, by the way, we, we're not going to pray. Um, now here's what's, here's what's happened. We, we started it at the basis of thinking, learning the city together. We've been praying the whole time. I mean, prayer has been a massive piece because, uh, we can't help but do it, you know? And, and a lot of our prayer has been, and I see, you know, in city movements, I, I see some that kind of come together initially because they're doing um, events together or worship type events or like joint services together. I see the prayer based movement and then I see the let's go and serve the city, you know, type movement. Those, they all three end up combining in different ways, but usually a city movement starting with, with one of those. And so we started with the serve model. Uh, I know a lot of great city movements that started with prayer and are flourishing and doing great. I think they both lead you to the same place. I think that, mm -hmm. you know, if you're doing it right um, and you start praying for each other and praying for your community, it's going to lead you into mobilizing in, into the community together and making the, you know, demonstrating the gospel together. And if you start with like, hey, we're going to learn our city and serve the city, I hope, I hope that it leads you to praying. It will. You can't, it's so hard. This work is so hard. You can't help but like be running towards prayer. So, yeah, thanks for that question. I have a question. Oh, oh. Go. No, go for it. <laughs> go no, I just wanted to um, ask, uh, because of who you are, having been a pastor before and now the position you're in, uh, incredible bridging in all of that. How are you, how's the Lord leading you in? um having church leadership get outside their walls a bit more into community how what are the roadblocks you've seen and also the uh the learning points of what you've experienced yeah good question when working with pastors is really hard um and i being a pastor is also really hard you know, and, and I think I'm grateful that I spent a decade doing this because the pressure, that pull of uh, that, the, the pull of, of doing everything that you have to do on Sunday morning to keep everything going is real. And I remember my, there was things in my heart that I wanted to do or things that I wanted to change, but I just, I just had to, to keep this thing going each week. 
And so, the, and then everybody's coming at you. Like as a pastor, I meant, I'm getting emails from people outside my congregation and calls saying, hey, I need you to show up to this, you know, pitching me for this. And then I'm getting this huge um, ask from inside the church as well. And so I think, especially pastors of churches that are a little bit larger, I mean, one of the downsides is you become good at saying no. And oftentimes I think you become inoculated to the ask and you end up missing out on a lot of good things. And I think that was true when I was doing it as well. Um, for right now, today, coming out of COVID, um, we're mobilizing churches right now is really, really tough. Um, it is, I think, the amount of, most of my time right now with pastors, I feel like is just being a sounding board as they're, trying to figure out what, what, who's actually in their church and what it's going to look like going forward and dealing with some of the grief and the emotional stuff around um, realizing that they spent a lot of time building this church up and they felt like there was a lot of energy in the room. And now there's just not as much energy or people in the room. And so helping them become aware of that and how much a measurement was there between their identity and the, size of their church and a lot of it's like I feel like a lot of my work right now isn't even in mobilizing churches it's just walking with some of these faith leaders and just being a sounding board for them as they kind of figure out what this is going to look like going forward um and I and they're most of the churches are reporting to me that like it the engagement of their people like get, just getting the people that they used to have to like pull off Sundays has been an incredible struggle. I think there's a lot of apathy and just weariness among a lot of the people that we lead. So I think that's a big challenge. And so then trying to get them to do something else right now, um, you know, I've been, I just feel like I've just been in a season of trying to walk with and help the, the faith leaders that I'm in instead of saying, hey, let's all do this, this thing together right now. Um, I want you to double back in on neighboring or whatever it might be. Um, it might be different in your city, but that's, that's what's been happening here around the the Denver metro area. So thank you. I, I so appreciate that. That's um, I feel like you just gave a, gave a great uh, state of the church leadership <laughs> in that simple yeah. explanation. And I, I think there's something um, to be said about the simple go with the willing. Yeah. And if we yeah, are and in I, an old paradigm that says it has to go through church to be valid um, right now, the church is exhausted and has no idea of how to how to emerge in a new way. And so, but I think there's a lot of willing, but um, I think there's I, a paradigm I, shift going on. So thank you for sharing that. Yeah, you bet. There, there, here's my encouragement for pastors is that you have a smaller, more committed core. And there's, there's some really cool stuff about that. So. Um, thank you. Uh, Danielle, you were going to ask something. Yeah, actually really similar to what Lynn was asking, um, just kind of, and this might be a question for you and Jeff in regards to mobilizing the churches. Did you, and I think especially in this time, going after the pastors or going after kind of those key people who you think are going to neighbor well? And, and it's something that I'm kind of finding to be a funny place right now. Like yeah. there's some pastors who are exhausted and some pastors who no matter how many times we're like, no, this is the vision. It seems like they don't get it, <laughs> but then yeah. there's like the con some of their congregation who is all about it. And you're like, okay. So I guess my question would be like, how, how would you, or how did you go about mobilizing that? Or I don't really know. I used to chase, <laughs> I, I used to chase around like the pastors of the larger churches and and some of the pastors of the largest churches are really in and really believe in this and kind of have the kingdom dna but i used to just chase people around and try to, and even when i would get them to start showing up it just felt like it was all like i was just always just pulling them along and so i think you know doing the person of peace principle from luke 10 of just looking for places where you have favor and then leaning into those places seems like the best the best way forward for me and then sometimes there are people like a lot of stuff we did in neighboring was like we got around the pastor because they're just super busy. And the idea of like going home after all the stuff they do and like being engaged in their neighborhood, they just weren't open to it. But a lot, but a lot of times like we get around them and and they're just their small groups would start doing our stuff and it would just start kind of lighting this like fire in 
in this vision, even, you know, from the bottom up. So I think it can happen both ways. Um, but it certainly is a unique time to be doing the work that a lot of us are doing, which is engaging faith leaders and their congregations. Um, the challenges that we have in front of us to do that right now are, are a lot higher than any time I can remember. Yeah. Cool. Thank you. Um, These are unprecedented days. Go ahead, Nate. Just want to comment. Thank you, Dave, so much. Um, I think to uh, Danielle, the um, and I'm not an expert by any means, but in our church, we've just started doing and not talking about it anymore. So there's a contingency of people that now we have maybe 15 neighborhoods that are doing. We started with one or two after COVID and just love your neighbors. Really the art of neighboring uh, principles, but what Jesus already said. And so we have this really groundswell of people doing what Dave talked about today in their own neighborhoods. And it's going to have to be reckoned with by church leaders here at this church because there's so many people finding traction and valid validity and meaning in doing what Jesus already said that it doesn't need talking about anymore. It needs doing and embracing and then connecting with other churches that are willing to do the same. And that's that's where I think the leadership city, citywide comes in is just finding other churches that will simply go from the ground up, not, not a mutiny by any means or anything like that, just a simple encouragement to do that, but it could start where we are in, in our proximity. Yeah, thanks. That's good. Anyone else? No. All right, man. Well, hey, thank you guys again. And, and hope you have a great day. <laughs> And hope that you're inspired to tonight <laughs> when you go home, or if you're out, or if you're at home right now, go next door right now. Hey, <laughs> what's your name? <laughs> or deliver some cookies or something. Let's let's get to know our neighbors. And I think especially as I just want to end with this, as leaders, it's so easy, and I've fallen into this throughout my whole life, to preach at others, tell others, man, you need to love your neighbor, man. You need to you need to do this, you need to do that. But man. You know, I think being married helps me tremendously. My wife sees the hypocrisy in me. I'm just preaching at others, and if we're not doing it as a family, and um, you yeah, know, I remember, remember uh, when we decided to foster and adopt. Um, I was preaching all this orphan stuff, and my wife just called me on and said, "We got to go down to that, that county meeting." I'm like, "No, no, <laughs> I want to encourage others to do it. It's not about uh, that's going to change everything for me personally, like that." You know what I mean? In effect. But man, I mean, just when we live it out and then people see it, like I think what you talked about when Nathan was just sharing is and we can preach it all we want, but people see people are seeing what we're doing, aren't they? People around us know who we really are. And um, that that message speaks louder than, than anything. If it's in our neighborhood or or in our city, whatever we're doing, you know, the most powerful message is is demonstrated, not just proclaimed. Um, so good word. Very good word, Dave. Thank you so much, man, for hanging with us for this last hour, man. I appreciate you, man. Appreciate your journey and your learning and your just just questioning and and just wanting to make the biggest difference you can. Thanks, Jeff. Good to see all of you. All right, y'all. Have a great day today. Thank you. Bye. All right. Bye bye.